So welcome everyone to the Saturday Engineering for Everyone series, uh, Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Uh, this is Earth Week, and uh, I hope I hope uh, you're enjoying this week. And this semester, and this seminar uh, talk is actually very well aligned with that theme. So, to get started, the first thing I would do is, is to uh, share a bit of housekeeping stuff around how to ask questions, uh, where uh, and 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 other things. Then I would introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Lara Waldrop, and then we'll uh, listen to her about. Uh, on the topic of, um, of sensing the earth. So with that, Lara, if you don't mind changing. Okay, so by default, the video and audio have been turned off for all participants, right? Uh, that's at the bottom corner uh, of your Zoom link. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have also enabled a live transcript for those who want uh, closed captioning. So there is a icon, icon that says CC, if you turn that on, you would be able to see the uh, live live captions. Uh, and the last point is, Lara, the next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, you have two options. One is uh, you can type your question on the chat box. Uh, again, it's at the bottom panel on your Zoom screen. Or you could unmute yourself and ask the question. And, and we would actually encourage you to ask questions, if, if that's okay with you, Lara. Absolutely, that's my yeah. preference as well. We do want an interactive session, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions, but you can also use the chat option if you'd like to type in the question. And uh, Bruce or me, uh, we will periodically uh, kind of maybe either either interrupt Lara or at the end of the talk, read out the questions to Lara so that she can answer and, and uh, tell you more about it. I appreciate okay. that. Great. So with that, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the seminar series. Uh, this is our uh, attempt to actually tell the broader audience of the Urbana-Champaign community about the very exciting research that happens uh, within the departments of uh, computer science, electrical and computer engineering, and other engineering departments in the College of Engineering uh, at Illinois. Uh, this started uh, from the physics department uh, before 2014. Uh, but from 2014, uh, ECE, the ECE department, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, we thought that there are several exciting things going on at the engineering side of things. And we started this in spring 2014. And since then, uh, it has been a very exciting series. Pre-COVID, we would have lots of people in our department building uh, show up for the seminar uh, at 11 a.m. There would be kiosks and exhibits uh, with, with actual experiments running for people to see and play with and for kids to come and play with. Uh, we are of course missing that right now, um, but we want to continue this over Zoom and hence this effort. We hope that once COVID uh, is behind us, we will resume the series uh, in, in, in person and we'd have, we'll have all these activities come back in person. So uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom today. Uh, with that, let me introduce the speaker for today. Uh, Professor Lara Waldrop is, uh, let me pull up, pull up her, her uh, bio. Yeah, she's an assistant professor and the YT Lowe Fellow in Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her research is actually focused on the development of uh, new kinds of ground and space-based sensing modalities for both Earth and Mars, which is very exciting and very timely at this point. And her work uh, involves mainly indirect sensing through, through uh, numerical models of chemical and ra radiative processes by various ground and space-based sensors, uh, including uh, scatter radar and spectroscopy, uh, photometry, inferom interferometry at wavelengths uh, ranging from near infrared to far ultraviolet. Uh, she's a very accomplished researcher. Uh, she got her PhD in astronomy and space physics at Boston University in 2004. Uh, then she served as the NSF SADAR steering committee from 2006 to 2010 uh, as the chair of the scientific advisory committee for uh, Arecibo Observatory in, in, in 2013 and 14. And, and recently she was selected as the PI of a NASA heliophysics mission 
uh, of opportunity for phase A concept study in advance of uh, down select ne next year. So um, she's been doing a fantastic research with NASA, uh, sensing Earth from a million miles away. And she's here to tell us all about that uh, for the, with this talk that's titled, What Does Earth Look Like from One Million Miles Away? With that, over to you, Lara. Thanks for uh, taking the time to give us this talk. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rami. Appreciate the, the warm introduction. Uh, so as, as, as you mentioned, uh, it's true, this subject has been near and dear to my heart uh, for almost 30 years now, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's something that I came across this image that's here on the title slide, for example, around that time uh, in, in high school, and it Im immediately caught my attention. And it, I knew that this is where I wanted to be spending uh, my time as a, as a career uh, professional. Uh, but at the same time, I'm hoping that none of you are looking at this picture and saying, well, what does Earth look like from one million miles away? This is it. I guess I can sign off now. I can stop watching the movie because the truth is this is not what Earth looks like from one million miles away. Uh, but I couldn't help start the talk with this iconic uh, photo. This is Earthrise taken in 1968 from NASA's Apollo 8 mission by the very first humans that ever orbited the moon. So think about that in your gut, what it meant to go on the other side of the moon and be cut off from Earth. You couldn't even see it anymore for the first time. Uh, and I think everyone really should know the names of these uh, incredibly brave astronauts. There was aeronautical engineer and mission commander, Frank Borman. There was a mechanical engineer, Jim Lovell. And there was especially the electrical engineer, William Anders, who was so struck when he saw the beauty of Earth for the first time from this distance that he took this impromptu tourist photo. I mean, these are, this is the official transcript of the recordings, and it was clearly not a scheduled uh, photo opportunity. Uh, but it, this photo is, has gone on to inspire uh, a sense of awe and wonder, uh, both in me and, and of course in countless others ever since. So, but in the end, as I mentioned, this photo is not the answer uh, to the question posed in the title of my talk, what does the earth look like from 1 million miles away? Because the truth is, even though this is the farthest any human being has ever gone, to take a photo of the Earth, this is still only a quarter of a million miles away. A million miles is four times farther than this. Uh, and so I've, even though I promise I'll give an answer to this question by the end of the talk, uh, I first want to explain how engineering makes it possible to even have an answer to this question, and most importantly, why that answer matters so much to modern life here on Earth. Uh, so the first thing to understand is just how unusual it is to get a camera that far away to be able to take a picture. So this is a, a, a snapshot from a movie that shows every object that's currently orbiting Earth as viewed looking down on Earth's North Pole. Now the data that's used to create this simulation came from measurements, uh, but it includes not only active satellites, but also the huge cloud of inactive debris uh, known as space junk. So anything bigger, it says here, bigger than a grapefruit can be measured uh, by the NORAD, this radar uh, chain across the United States. Now, once I play the movie that sets these objects in motion, uh, I'd like the first thing for you to notice is that the farther away the satellite is from Earth, the longer it takes to complete a full orbit. This time is known as the orbital period. Uh, and I imagine that some of you have been to a science museum that had a gravitational well exhibit. These are those, you put the coin in the slot at the edge of the big funnel and you let it roll on a curved surface and watch it spiral down towards the hole in the middle. And so it starts slowly at first, it takes a long time to make one big loop, uh, but then it gets faster and faster uh, as it orbits closer and closer to the hole. And that is exactly how gravitational orbits work. So you can see a lot of the orbits, I'll go back one slide, you can see a lot of them are clustered around this ring, I've colored it orange here. Uh, this is one of the most common satellite orbits, it's known as geostationary orbit. Uh, and this one lies at the distance where the satellite periods are exactly 24 hours. And this distance is around 26,000 miles from Earth. Uh, from this vantage, it's possible to look down on a given location near Earth's equator continuously. 
because the satellite takes 24 hours to rotate around the Earth, but meanwhile, the Earth took 24 hours to spin. So it's always looking at that same spot. So this is a popular orbit choice for navigation and weather satellites, and of course, military reconnaissance, spy satellites. Uh, there's quite a few of them up there, I would expect. Uh, but the vast majority of satellites, including the International Space Station, are orbiting the Earth within just a few hundred miles of the surface. This is an altitude range known as low Earth orbit. I've colored this one here in yellow. And so what you'll see is that low Earth orbit is by far the dominant place where uh, orbiting objects exist, uh, man-made uh, objects exist. Now, although this movie makes it look like these objects are orbiting Earth in empty space, uh, the Earth's atmosphere is actually dense enough for those satellites in low Earth orbit to experience frictional drag. And much like the tires on a car that will eventually roll to a stop, due to the friction of the road, satellites in low Earth orbit will gradually slow down and thereby lose altitude until eventually they fall back to Earth. Usually they splash in the ocean. If they're small enough, we probably heard they burn up. Uh, that's very true. Uh, anything bigger than a bread box or so will typically just burn up and, and it never reaches the ground. Now, one of the biggest challenges facing satellite deployment to low Earth orbit is being able to predict that frictional drag that governs their orbital trajectory. Right now, it's impossible to predict when and where a satellite will fall out of orbit, a big one. And that's because we don't know what that frictional drag is that it's experiencing. Uh, and the other thing we don't know is the frictional drag that the nearby objects are experiencing. Uh, and these are objects that which might collide, for example, with a satellite of interest, an active satellite. Uh, the International Space Station, for example, routinely maneuvers out of the way uh, to avoid oncoming objects, to avoid collisions. Uh, but very few satellites have these kinds of active propulsion systems. And so as a result, the danger of runaway collisions increasing the debris field in space is a very real danger. And that makes the need for accurate knowledge of atmospheric density also very real, very immediate. Uh, since that would enable accurate prediction of this drag and thus orbital trajectories. Now, unfortunately, atmospheric density is not easy to measure. Besides satellites, only rockets and some balloons can even reach the outermost layers of the atmosphere. You can see they're named here. Uh, thermosphere and exosphere are the ones that span low Earth orbit. Uh, and uh, although there's sensors that can take a sample of atmospheric gases and make a local measurement, at a given point in space and time, much like a thermometer could be used to measure temperature at a given point in space and time. If you wanted to make a map of temperature, you would need thermometers all over the place. And it's the same with density. If we sent sensors up into space, we would have to have orbital constellations of these kinds of sensors. And even then, we would have to measure it all the time because the atmosphere is always changing. And so what ends up happening is that there's a lot of things we don't know about the atmosphere. And this picture here is actually a really good example. Uh, you know, I pulled it off the internet, it looks nice, but you'll notice that there's no outer limit. And that's because no one knows how far the atmosphere goes. And this picture here on the right is one of the only photos ever taken. And I'll be, I'll be honest, this one's much farther away than a million miles. Uh, because a million miles is about the width of the picture. You can see Earth is that teeny tiny blue dot in the middle. Uh, and this is uh, an image of the Earth which shows its atmosphere extending well beyond the orbit of the moon. Uh, and so that's the question of, well, how big is it? So that's, that's a discovery, curiosity question. Uh, but the fact that the atmosphere is changing all the time means that it's really difficult to measure these densities and get the answers to these questions without routine observations. Um, one of the ways it's changing, it changes in response to tropospheric conditions. You can see that's the lowest altitude atmosphere layer close to the surface of the Earth. So things like thunderstorms uh, can propagate disturbances upwards uh, into this region of low Earth orbit. Uh, it changes in response to the moon. So just like ocean, the atmosphere has tides and waves. Uh, but the main driver of atmospheric variability by far is the sun. And this is where things get really exciting. So I imagine most of you had a chance to see the solar eclipse a few years ago. And it was visible across most of the US, including Southern Illinois, 
Uh, I had a chance to go see it and I, if you know, if you missed it, I think you should try really hard to get the next opportunity. Uh, it was truly spectacular because during an eclipse, the bright disk of the sun is blocked by the moon, right? And so what that means is that you are able, the human eye is able to see this huge outer expanse of the solar atmosphere known as the corona. It becomes visible. Usually it's too dim relative to that bright disk, uh, but during the eclipse, all of that other light is blocked. Now the sun's magnetic field loops and coils through it and it traps and heats the coronal plasma to more than a million degrees. But huge blobs can be ejected in these tremendous explosions that carry that hot plasma and magnetic field far into space. And I've got three movies here. They were all acquired during the same time. So these are coincident movies from three different imagers that are looking at the sun on a NASA mission known as Solar Dynamics Observatory. And so I'll play the first one. So what you see, there's that coronal mass ejection, it's called. It just blew off the, the left-hand side of the moon. I'll play this one, the, sorry, the sun. I'll play this one one more time if I can find my cursor. There we go. Well, now they're all playing. Uh, so on the left side, the middle one is zoomed out a bit more. So you can see it's constantly evolving. There's a streamers, that coronal structure, and that was a coronal mass ejection. And these things happen all the time, pretty frequently, uh, at least, let's say, a dozen events a year. Uh, here's another view, even farther away now, much, much farther away. Uh, and you can see these disturbances propagate uh, into interplanetary space. And it is not at all unusual for one to come towards the Earth uh, and impact our uh, life here. And the outer atmosphere is, is the very first uh, line of defense. So what happens, uh, here's a cartoon. So here's another coronal mass ejection uh, coming off the sun, this big explosion. It's in this loop structure because that's the orientation of the magnetic fields and the plasma is trapped. And here's that big blob. So the blob of plasma is coming off, uh, tra plasma is trapped, magnetic fields are trapped. And when they encounter the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic field lines, it's called reconnect. They touch and they join. And right there, just released a tremendous amount of energy. And where is that energy going? It is flowing back down Earth's magnetic field lines right towards the pole. Oops. Well, that didn't work. Let's skip ahead quite a little bit. So here comes, here comes that uh, field line. I think that's John. John, could you mute your microphone? Is anybody able to mute? John? Thank you. Thanks. It's just a lot of background noise. So here come those field lines. This is that reconnection on the day side, on the sunward side of the Earth's magnetic field. Here's the reconnection down the tail on the night side. Uh, and here is that explosion of energy. These are electrons that are flowing down the field lines. And you can see they make this beautiful uh, aurora. Now, the problem is, though, that the electrons that are flowing down these field lines cause a lot of problems for humans and the technology that we rely on. So these flows are essentially electrical currents, exactly the same ones that power the outlets in your house, for example. It is electrons moving on a wire. Uh, but these aren't confined to travel within insulated wires uh, the way that power cords are. And these will flow wherever they find the least resistance, and then they can also induce unconfined currents elsewhere, like in gas pipelines or even in the electric power grid. Uh, and then it can cause dangerous heating and even large scale blackouts. Uh, but of course, the, this phenomenon, this beautiful phenomenon known as the aurora uh, is lovely. And I, I hope all of you have, have, have been able to see that sometime in your life. Of course, it's most often found in the polar regions, uh, but it gets as Southern, uh, it gets to Illinois uh, for really large storms. The stronger the storm, the more that ring uh, expands downwards to lower altitudes, both uh, in from the North Pole moving towards the equator, but also in the Southern Pole moving up towards the, the Southern Hemisphere. Now, aurora is the manifestation 
uh, of the excess energy that the electrons give to the atmosphere when they collide with the particles there. And uh, this is a way, this light that's being given off is a way for the atmosphere to release that excess energy. Uh, but the atmosphere dissipates excess energy in the form of light all the time. The difference is that aurora is just so bright that you're able to see it with the human eye. But from the International Space Station, for example, uh, they can see what's called air glow, which is essentially aurora, but it's so dim and it exists at lower latitudes all the time away from the polar caps. So here's a, a movie of what this looks like from the International Space Station. You'll see there's three colors. There's a yellow, there's a green, and there's a red. Uh, the colors here, and these are the, the wavelengths to be more precise, of the light that the air glow gives off is very closely related, is dependent on which atoms and molecules absorbed that energy and how much energy did they, did they absorb. And so each atom and molecule has a set number of colors, like a fingerprint, that it's able to emit. Uh, and this is associated with the internal arrangement of electrons and protons and neutrons in its nucleus uh, of these different uh, species. And measuring the emissions or reflections, could be scattered light, uh, of distant objects at these specific wavelengths, once you know what they are for the target of interest, uh, this is a powerful tool that we use to learn about the properties of objects that are too far away for direct sensing. And this is the technique known as remote sensing. Uh, and this is uh, the foundation of the research that I do at Illinois, uh, but what many other of our faculty here in the area of remote sensing uh, also do. Uh, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the colors I mentioned, you'll see there was a red one. Uh, that's a very famous bright oxygen emission line, very low uh, energy, doesn't take much to excite that atom so that it releases when it relaxes and gets rid of that energy. It turns into, it turns out a red photon. Uh, but uh, the electromagnetic spectrum goes beyond just the colors that are visible. And it turns out that at Earth, the uh, ultraviolet is by far the brightest emissions to target, uh, certainly in the outer atmosphere. So close to, the, close to the inner part of the atmosphere where there's a lot of molecules, these molecules can ring and they vibrate and they twist. And because of that, they can introduce bands and those typically are in the infrared. Uh, but when you get to higher altitudes, uh, what you typically see are very, very bright uh, uh, emissions in the ultraviolet. And this is a, a key target for upper atmospheric remote sensing. Uh, here's a picture of the sun acquired with different filters. And so the idea is that you could have a filter wheel, let's say. It's a, you have an optical device that takes pictures, a camera, and you put a different filter in front of it. And that filter can let through just a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum at a time. And a different filter would let through a different part of the spectrum. And by putting these filters in the path of your optical instrument, your camera, uh, you're able then to see the same object in different ways. And the information, for example, that can be gleaned from uh, the visible filter, which is the orange sun that I think everyone is familiar with, like every child, right, colors the sun orange, uh, but it emits so many colors besides orange. Uh, and in fact, not even colors at all. I mean, ultraviolet, it's not visible to the human eye. Um, and so I, you know, I, won't, I won't go through in detail. Uh, this is, there's many, many more beautiful photographs like this on, online on, uh, with, on NASA's uh, website, but just this idea that measuring something in its colors can tell you a lot about that object. That's the idea I'd like you to, to, to keep in your mind. So I mentioned ultraviolet being a, a key uh, wavelength of interest for upper atmospheric remote sensing. Uh, in fact, the first and only astronomical instrument that was ever sent to the moon, this was on the Apollo 16 mission, and in fact, it's still there. Here's a photograph of it, uh, was an ultraviolet camera that was invented for that purpose. Uh, so the idea is that they knew that the Earth should be bright in ultraviolet. No one had ever seen it. Uh, and so they sent this camera to the moon. There is a uh, testing, the testing version. They made two. This is typical with space deployments. You make two, 
and you send one up and you leave the other one on the ground in case you need to test it under different environmental circumstances, for example, uh, that ground instrument is right now at the Air and Space Museum, if, if anyone's curious to see that in Washington, DC. But this is the first picture that was acquired. Uh, and here's that glow that Earth emits in the ultraviolet. And you can see there's the shadow of the Earth on the night side. Uh, and everywhere that's glowing, this is not like one of those uh, cameras where it's, it's uh, spread out. Uh, in other words, it's, it's only glowing on the surface. Everywhere you're seeing glow away from the surface of the Earth is a real atmospheric, uh, in this case, hydrogen atom emitting that light. And so it extends quite far uh, from the surface of the Earth. At this point, no one quite knew how far. Uh, but I want to say a few words about the man who invented this camera. Uh, his name was George Robert Carruthers. Uh, and he was, in fact, a graduate of the University of Illinois. He received his bachelor's of science degree here in aeronautical engineering in 1961. Uh, he then continued and did his graduate work, earning a master's degree in nuclear engineering just one year later. And three years, uh, sorry, two years in 1964, two years after that, earned his PhD in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. Uh, and so, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to say that Illinois is continuing his legacy by introducing the next, there's only ever been one UV camera like this that was used for Earth remote sensing that was launched at such a distant uh, vantage. Uh, Illinois is now leading the second one. It's known as GLIDE, Global Lyman Alpha Imager of the Dynamic Exosphere. Exosphere, you remember, is this outermost atmospheric layer. This is the one that we hardly know anything about, but it impacts uh, both space assets in the region and it responds to space weather. So by, by imaging it, we would learn a lot more about both of those processes, which would uh, greatly advance our ability to predict and mitigate some of the harmful effects uh, to our assets and on, in space and on the ground. Uh, Lyman Alpha is the name of the ultraviolet uh, emission. It is a specific transition. It's 121 uh, nanometers is the wavelength. Uh, and global imager, I think, speaks for itself. This will be the first uh, global images that, that we've ever obtained of the exosphere on a routine basis. You can see the little artist rendition of what we expect it to look like. And what you can't see in this image, this is a cartoon, so this is still not the image from a million miles away that I promised at the beginning. Uh, but what you can't see, perhaps uh, maybe not well, is that it starts off, there's blue. I mean, this is data. This is a simulation of the data of what we expect to see. Starts off blue, it gets green, it gets orange, it gets yellow, and then it gets orange again. That orange again, that little tiny bit of orange in the middle, that is the disk of the Earth. So we expect this cloud of glowing UV emission, ultraviolet emission, to be genuinely huge. Uh, we are expecting it to extend about halfway uh, to the distance of the, of the moon. And then here's the, the spacecraft. Uh, you'll see there's two uh, fields of view essentially emanating. Those are the camera apertures. Uh, those are meant to be the look directions, so to speak. Uh, and then on the backside facing the sun, is our solar panels. And the nice thing about this mission is that we will be continuously pointing at the earth all the time, which means that our solar panels will always be pointed towards the sun. It's a nice thermal environment, lots of power. Uh, and so this is a, a very uh, ideal uh, mission for this purpose. Uh, so like Apollo 16, GLIDE will be hosting this compact but powerful UV imaging system. Uh, and I'll just point out some of the items here. This is the payload, by the way. If I go back one slide, this is that little box that sits on top of the big box. So the big box is the satellite bus. It's got the, the propulsion system and the battery packs and the antennas to talk to the Earth. Uh, and then the payload is the actual camera. Uh, and so this is the actual camera. Uh, and what you see is that it's actually two cameras. Uh, it's an NFI, narrow field imager. That's the one that has a little tiny field of view. It's the, the optical path is shown in green, uh, light green. And then there's the wide field imager, WFI, and it has a much larger field of view. So these two fields of views will be nested so that we will have simultaneously uh, a close-up view of the Earth at very high resolution 
and a wide field, lower resolution, uh, but it will capture the entire exosphere in one image. Uh, there is, there's some doors you can see, uh, some star trackers. Uh, this gizmo is, is a student-led uh, payload. It's a secondary payload. Uh, which is being built uh, currently. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they're working on it right now by students in the aerospace engineering department here at Illinois uh, in coordination with students at Boston University's uh, Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Engineering there. Uh, Gizmo is a uh, essentially very tiny diodes, photodiodes, so they're sensitive to light. Uh, and you'll see that they're pointing in the other direction. So the idea is that the NFI and the WFI will be looking back towards Earth all the time, measuring the uh, hydrogen that's glowing in the ultraviolet. And the reason that hydrogen glows is because the sunlight is shining on it. The sunlight is what's giving it that excess energy. And so when it releases that photon back, essentially you see it reflection. But Gizmo would measure the source. It's looking back towards the sun. And so what we're measuring the solar source of that scattered emission uh, simultaneously. Uh, you can see in the uh, the optical passes that the picture on the right here is the payload with the cover off. And you can see that follow the green path, for example, the light uh, comes in, it goes through a filter wheel. So this is that filter I was telling you about. So we can select uh, which colors we want to see. Uh, and we're, of course, interested in the Lyman alpha, as I mentioned, but we'll have some other filters there. Uh, to do some more interesting science and, and as a way of mostly it's a way of calibrating the instrument making sure that we're only getting Lyman alpha uh, emission which is our target uh, but there's that filter wheel and then it hits a mirror and then another mirror and then it goes into a detector uh, the wide field imager does something similar but it's got two extra mirrors so it comes in first bounces then it bounces again then it goes to the filter wheel and then it bounces two more times before it heads to its own detector the detectors are identical. They are exactly the same kind of camera you would have in your cell phone. The difference is that these uh, in your cell phone, just like these, they're only sensible, sensitive to visible photons, but we're feeding it ultraviolet photons, which have a much smaller wavelength and a much larger energy. And so the way we do that is to take advantage of the photoelectric effect for which Einstein won a Nobel prize, where a high energy photon will hit and release an electron from a substrate. And then that electron cascades and releases a whole bunch more electrons so that by the end of it, one electron turns into, sorry, one ultraviolet photon turns into millions of electrons, which then excite a phosphor screen, which gives off visible photons when it gets hit by electrons. So there's some steps involved that make it a little bit more sophisticated than a regular cell phone camera. Uh, but nonetheless, the detection principles are identical. Uh, the mission, uh, sorry, you've got a question. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. I think there's a question on the chat session. Okay, uh, great. Um, I'm not able to is, see it. That's okay. John's asking, why is Lyman alpha so important? That's a, that's a good question. So Lyman alpha is the brightest emission. It's one of the very few lines that hydrogen atoms give off. So each atom has its own spectral fingerprint. It only has a few uh, colors, so to speak, that it will emit, that it will absorb and re-emit. And hydrogen, uh, I should say, the more electrons an atom has, the more color options it can have. And hydrogen only has one electron, which means that it has very few wavelengths to choose from if you want to do remote sensing of gaseous hydrogen. And in, in the case of, of hydrogen, the Lyman alpha line, which is the electronic transition from the ground state to the next state up, uh, which is a very common place for these electrons to be, is by far the brightest line. And so that's, that's why there's the target. Uh, so uh, this mission, GLIDE, uh, has been uh, selected for development. So we're now currently in phase B. Uh, we are proceeding towards launch in 2025. Uh, and another similarity with George Carruthers UV camera, GLIDE is also a mission of opportunity, which means that we are taking advantage of a launch opportunity uh, that is not just for our mission only. And in fact, the, the, the host mission is known as IMAP, 
Uh, it's the Interplanetary Mapping and Acceleration Probe, huge NASA mission. Uh, it's been in development for, for many, many years now. Uh, but the rocket that will send IMAP into space has what's called an ESPA ring. And you can see this, there's a picture here of the rocket fairing and inside is, the, is a ring. And on that ring are at least five slots to stick on five smaller satellites. And so this long rocket will launch, IMAP will be deployed, and then one at a time, the five secondary payloads, one of which would be GLIDE, will be slowly released one after the other. Uh, and then they would start their own propulsions and, and get where they need to go uh, into space. Uh, here's a, a better picture of the satellite bus that I mentioned. On the middle picture here, the black box on top, that's the payload box. Uh, and you can see the solar panels in the back. And here's the sizes, 46 inches, 40 inches, 38 inches. You know, this thing's about the size of a, the refrigerator you'd find in a, in a student's dorm room. Uh, and then here's a, a view from the back. Where are we going? Unlike Apollo 16, GLIDE is going to the best possible place you can put a satellite for Earth remote sensing. Uh, and that's what's known as the L1 Lagrange point. I have an arrow pointing to it. This figure on the left, what it's showing is the contours of constant gravity. And the idea is that the sun is in the middle, just like I, I told you about that gravitational well that you might find at a museum, a science museum. Uh, this is the same idea. The sun is so massive that it essentially pulls everything in towards it, has a very deep gravitational potential well. And there's Earth, which it's not as massive, so its hole isn't as deep, but there is a spot in between where their gravity cancels out. And it's very easy to have a spacecraft be there and maintain an orbit around this point. It takes very little energy to maintain that orbit. And every few months, you have to burn some thrusters to kind of get back on track. Uh, but it's a, it's a place where stable orbits are possible, long-term orbits. Uh, and so here is the first answer to the question, because of course, GLIDE will not be the first spacecraft to ever go here. There is another mission uh, called DISCOVER. This is a partnership between NASA and NOAA uh, that has many instruments on it, one of which is known as the EPIC uh, camera. And EPIC has been acquiring images of Earth from a million miles away that look just like this. Uh, and the goal of this mission, it also has optical filters. This is a more of a true color rendition. Uh, but the goal of this mission is to look at aerosols and climate change uh, for the most part. Uh, in the case of GLIDE, of course, we will be looking at the hydrogen gas that's emitted by uh, the upper atmosphere. Uh, and that's a considerably larger cloud. So here's a picture of our orbit. You can see it's a quite a large orbit. Uh, the exosphere is drawn to scale for the most part, to the extent that we think we know what, it, what, what to expect when we get there. Uh, you can see lunar orbit. So lunar orbit I mentioned is a quarter of a million miles away from Earth, and we're going four times farther. So that spot that says L1, that is that gravitational equilibrium a million miles away, and we will be in a halo orbit. It's called a, a Lissajous halo orbit around that point. It will take us about four months after being deployed uh, and kicked off of our rocket ride uh, in order to get there. Uh, and then once there, we'll have a, a minimum of two year mission. Uh, and we're really hoping to be able to stay uh, longer. Of course, it depends on how long our propulsion will keep us uh, in orbit around this point in space and, and keep our, our batteries uh, able to, to communicate with the spacecraft. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, I promised you that image and I gave you the epic image, but I am going to be promising many, many more images to come. Uh, and these are, this is an example of what we expect that to look like. Uh, the units here, this is the Lyman alpha radiance. Radiance is essentially how bright is it? Uh, and this KR, kilorayleigh, one kilorayleigh is a billion photons. So when I said it's bright, it's, it's exceptionally bright because we're talking about a 25, uh, possibly even a 50 kilorayleigh signal. Uh, and so uh, I'm very excited uh, to be able to um, look forward to that opportunity uh, in the future. I've just got one slide left. I wanted to leave you with what's perhaps the most famous image of Earth ever acquired. Uh, this is the view from Voyager. Uh, this photo was taken in 1990, just 34 minutes before Voyager turned off its cameras forever. 
Uh, and uh, this is, of course, much farther than a million miles. This was 3.7 billion miles away after a decade of touring the solar system and returning the most beautiful uh, imagery uh, anyone had ever seen up until then. Uh, and I just want a, a quote as a, as a last uh, parting thought uh, to this talk. Uh, quote, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, the famous astronomer who first proposed using Voyager to uh, image Earth as it receded from view as Voyager left our solar system uh, over the course of that, over the course of its tour. Uh, he famously said, uh, look at that dot. And that dot, uh, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, we do have time for questions and discussions. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, let me start. So Lara, you said uh, the glider glide, right? Is that, is that- Glide, the, that's uh, right. Glide. So two years. So is it bottlenecked by thrusters? But because batteries should not be a problem given the uh, solar cells are facing the sun all the time or no? That's true, they are facing all the time. You're right, it's not the batteries, uh, it's, it's the propulsion, it's the tank. It's the size of, it's a mass problem actually more than anything. Uh, but two, NASA always has two year missions, all missions are two years. And then there's the opportunity to extend it through another proposal cycle, essentially, into what's called an extended mission phase. Uh, we are hoping to have enough propulsion to have at least one extended mission phase. That would be our goal. Uh, but because we're so interested in observing the variability of this region in response to the sun, and because the sun itself has an 11 year cycle of activity, we would very much like to at least observe half of a cycle to catch those, to, to really understand those trends better. So, you know, that would be five and a half years. And I think that's that's about as much as we could expect our tank to hold. Sure. Other questions? Yeah, what's the shape of uh, isogravity contour or zero gravity contour around the sun? You know, Earth being just one of the players and that too probably changing so the shape probably changes but then towards the earth it is one distance and around it who knows what shape certainly what you're describing is a is a two body problem if you're only considering the earth and the sun in pair uh, and that's something that i think can be solved analytically i don't know offhand what the shape is i do know that there are other stable equilibria besides this l1 point so l4 and l5 you can see are on the leading and trailing edges uh, 60 degrees, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and they rotate with the Earth. So this entire, if Earth rotates around the sun, this entire pattern, of course, rotates with it. Uh, and those L4 and L5s are famous in Jupiter, for example, uh, as being equilibria where asteroids tend to congregate. So I don't know if you've ever, if you're familiar with the Trojan asteroids, uh, it's because of Jupiter's sun gravity equilibrium uh, and they follow in the leading and trailing orbit of Jupiter for that reason. Uh, but an orbit around the sun is, of course, not a two-body problem because of Mercury and Venus and Mars and the moon. Uh, and so it, we're very fortunate to have fast computers these days to calculate these orbits quickly. Laura, could you, could you talk about the imaging from uh, other... Uh, rockets or satellites like going to Mars and you know, from a little closer, there's a different uh, bands. Sure, uh, sure. On uh, one of the, the best imaging cameras uh, actually in NASA's fleet is Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and uh, our project scientist on the team uh, has worked very closely with images of the Martian exosphere as observed from 
Hubble. Earth is not the only planet with an exosphere. Exospheres are very common. It's the outermost atmospheric layer. It's the boundary that separates the uh, collisionally dominated, where it's a very dense atmosphere and the particles all hit each other and, and share their energy, uh, to one where it's so tenuous that they never encounter each other at all. There's a transition there. Uh, Mars has one, Titan has one. Uh, so certainly Hubble has numerous filters. Uh, the way that I described with our filters where there's an actual filter wheel in the path of the optical of the light coming in, uh, that's only one way to do it. There are other ways to isolate spectral features such as dispersion. If you pass the light through a slit, for example, it will disperse into its colors, much like a prism would, uh, and then at, at that point, you just put your detector in the physical place where the color exists that you would like to target. And so some instruments are built uh, on that principle, the grading spectrometers and, and so forth, some slit spectrographs. Uh, there's quite a few that use that principle, even on Hubble uh, as well. But as far as imaging, you want to take a camera image. Uh, as far as I know, this is, well, in my opinion, let's say, this is the best way to do it. Uh, because the light is all filtered uh, at the same time. With a slit, you would have to physically move the field of view uh, to make a, an image, and even then it would only move in one direction. So it, it builds up global images more slowly than, than a single camera frame would, for example. Okay. Hey, Laura, this is Pete. Hi. Very interesting stuff. And I had uh, one question popped up to my brain. Maybe you said it. Uh, how do you launch these things? Are you rent a rocket or what? Well, that's that's the that's the good part is that no, where the NASA put out a solicitation a few years back that says IMAP is absolutely being launched and it is going to the L1 Lagrange point and it's going to have room for one science mission of opportunity. And I said it has to be mine. Exospheric science has to be done from the L1 Lagrange point. And so that started the proposal cycle. It went through, our first proposal was submitted in 2018. And then we were chosen to continue into concept, concept development. The concept study report, all thousand and six pages of it was submitted last summer. Uh, and now we've recently been selected to proceed into development phase B, where we define requirements and we put together a uh, design both of hardware and mission and personnel and schedule and budget, it becomes much more formal. Uh, and then at that point, there's only one more gate before proceeding into actual implementation uh, and launch. And so that gate will happen at the preliminary design review, which will be uh, in the uh, this coming winter. Uh, but as far as the launch is concerned, it's an, it's an opportunity. It's, it's what's known as a, a rideshare mission. And this is something that NASA has only gotten started uh, with their rideshare in initiative just in the past few years, where they're having these kinds of opportunities for smaller missions that otherwise wouldn't have uh, the ability to get into space, certainly not the ability to get into space at this location. Low Earth orbit tends to be easier uh, access to, to space than, than something like this. Lara, I yes. have a question. Sure. You have done some previous work of ex exospheric inversions, right? Uh, with, with, from previous uh, missions. I Can have. you say a few things about your previous work and how this glide is going to be different from what you might have most recently achieved? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, let me go back to a slide that will make that more clear. Uh, this one, this is a good slide for that. So the previous work, I, I've been working with uh, this emission data. So this is this Lyman alpha ultraviolet emission. It's only able to be measured from space because the lower atmosphere absorbs it. So you cannot measure ultraviolet emissions from the ground. So from space, there are two missions uh, that have been launched in the past decade that measured Lyman alpha. Uh, neither one is currently acquiring data anymore. Well, one, one might be. Uh, still acquiring a bit of data, uh, but it's not at its full capabilities. One is what's known as the uh, timed mission, thermosphere, ionosphere, mesosphere, energetics, and dynamics. That was in low Earth orbit. 
So when measuring Lyman alpha from low Earth orbit, the best place to look is sideways. And in sideways, this, is, this one was with a slit spectrograph. So there's the slit, the light disperses, you put the position of the camera essentially where you want to measure. This is an ultraviolet, of course, uh, sensor. Uh, and then this, the slit was scanned across what's known as the limb of the Earth. So you can imagine you're on an orbit around in low Earth orbit looking sideways and scanning sideways. Uh, through that region, the inversion, as you described it, is the retrieval, the uh, inferring something about the atmosphere from that data is very difficult because the photons get reabsorbed. Every time a hydrogen atom gives off its energy in the form of a photon, another hydrogen next to it immediately absorbs it and rescatters it. And this happened hundreds and hundreds of times. So by the time you see a photon, it's very difficult to say, well, how many hydrogens are there? Because you don't know how many times it's scattered. It takes uh, uh, the assistance. The data analysis requires uh, modeling that process in a, in a computationally intensive way. Uh, the other data that I've been looking at is a sensor that's a lot like Glide. It is a photometer. It has a, it's a single pixel. Okay, so it makes only one measurement, uh, but it has a very tiny line of sight. Uh, and in fact, there's two and they, they make a, a V essentially, and then they spin like this on the spacecraft. And the nice thing about this one, this is a mission known as twins. Uh, twins had two spacecraft and they were both in orbits similar to geostationary orbit. So they're looking back at earth and they're both doing this kind of windshield wiper motion with their field of view. Uh, and what we've been able to do with that data, because you have overlapping lines of sight through the same region, is apply the same principles of computational imaging that are used in medical tomography, for example, MRI machine image inversions. Uh, we tomographically imaged the exosphere from that data set. Uh, that requires, that's not something Glide can do because all of their lines of sight are pretty much parallel. Uh, so that's not a technique we can really apply except as the Glide moves from one phase of its orbit to another phase, there'll be some overlap but that means three months go by. That's a long time to assume things are stable temporarily, uh, when, especially if it's a mission trying to investigate dynamics. Um, question from Neil on the chat. Neil is a 10 year old. Um, he asks, have similar images been taken of other planets? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, in fact, I, I, I should have included those perhaps. It's an oversight on my part. The Martian images that were acquired by the Hubble Space Telescope are beautiful. Uh, Hubble in general is famous for its beautiful photos. Um, but this, uh, the images in particular of this Lyman Alpha cloud, this, this ultraviolet emission uh, that Glide is focused on, uh, certainly are available um, of Mars. There have been some other images from many older sensors acquired of Venus, for example. Um, but imaging in general, where you're not so focused on the ultraviolet uh, hydrogen emission, uh, perhaps other colors, or uh, you can stack colors so that it looks more realistic the, the way the human eye would, for example. Uh, Hubble also acquires a, a tremendous number of images of, of solar system objects, uh, and of course, beyond our solar system. Uh, I encourage you the, the, to look at NASA's uh, pages on this. They, NASA has, a, they take outreach very seriously. I mean, perhaps it's from the fact that the very first photo of Earth was almost accidental uh, and, and acquired in a, in a tourist snapshot way. Um, but since then, it, it's absolutely part of NASA's mission to make those images as uh, awe-inspiring and available to the public as possible. So I, I encourage you to look, look for those. Uh, can I ask a question? This is Xiu Ling. Please. Yeah, hi, Lara. I really enjoyed your talk and congratulations on, on winning the Glide and the whole mission. Uh, my question is at the component level, uh, I, you must have given the size and the weight for this UV imager. Um, what component is the most challenging one in terms of sensitivity, size and weight? Uh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, let's see. Probably, I mean, the, the, the payload is always the one that gets the most attention because the payload is the one that's custom. 
everything else needs to have heritage. Otherwise it's risky. And NASA is not too fond of risk. Uh, okay. Even our payload has a lot of heritage. Even our, our analysis algorithms, as Erhan mentioned, have a lot of heritage. Uh, and so the idea is that we want this mission to work right from the start. Uh, that being said, there are a lot of unique aspects of this payload. Of, of course, this is not something you buy in a store. Uh, even the sensors are, to some extent, custom. Certainly the uh, way that we read it out, for example, all the electronics are, are custom for the, for the mission. But as far as size and weight, uh, the thing I'm keeping my eye on the most is the uh, propulsion tank. I don't know if, if you heard earlier, I, I personally, as the scientist leading the mission, I prefer that tank to be absolutely as large as possible. I want this mission to last as long as possible. And that's the limit on our lifetime. Thank you. Sure. Here's, here's the size. Yeah, size is, by the way, is very tightly constrained. We, we have to fit in the, the box that we've been given. Uh, Laura, could you say anything about the other missions that are in the same rocket? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not too familiar with those, to be honest. Uh, <clears throat> I remember I, I paid a lot of attention back at the com competition phase, <laughs> but we're, not all of them were in competition with one another, for example. So there is a, uh, our mission GLIDE is being supported through the solar terrestrial probes uh, at NASA, but also within the larger division of heliophysics science. Mm -hmm. uh, heliophysics is also sponsoring a technology demo mission. And so the idea is that they don't have a science goal. They're not investigating something that will advance scientific knowledge, uh, but they are advancing the capabilities uh, of things like solar sails, for example. And so I know that there's at least one tech demo uh, mission that Helio Physics is sponsoring. My understanding from uh, of the other uh, secondary payloads is that they're coming from other NASA divisions, such as astronomy, for example, but I'm, I'm not familiar with those details. Ara, will sure. you be there uh, during Solar Max? Is that more or less? That's the, that's the idea. Right now, our launch is scheduled. It's, it's fuzzy. It's sometime between February and September of 2025. It makes planning a little bit tricky, uh, but that's very close to the maximum phase of the solar 11-year solar cycle. Uh, and so with a two-year mission and possibly a two-year follow-on mission, we will be capturing it from its peak, uh, sliding down towards the, towards the minimum. And, and we're hoping to see a lot of storms. Lara, another quick question. Sure. Your cameras are essentially looking at the reflection of the sun's light from the Earth's atmosphere. Are there more? Are there other techniques like active cameras which send their own light and then look at the reflections and and have control on the lights that they send or the wavelengths that they send out? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that's that's not. It's a it's a form of remote sensing known as active remote sensing. Uh, this technique is what's known as passive remote sensing. We're simply observing the light that's there. Uh, but certainly uh, what the, the questioner is describing is a technique called LIDAR, which is much like radar, where you send a radio wave and you look at its reflections off of an object to learn something about that object. Uh, LIDAR works exactly the same way, but it typically does it with visible photons. Uh, Gary Swinson here in our department has done quite a lot of work with LIDAR. Uh, he and I, in fact, have worked together. We've designed LIDAR for remote sensing of the Martian atmosphere, for example. Uh, LIDAR from this vantage would require so much power to send a bright enough light that you even measure a detectable backscatter. Uh, in fact, it's somewhat challenging even from uh, low Earth orbit, where power is not quite as much of, a, of an issue but still from a small spacecraft where, where power is limited, uh, it tends to not be a space-based technique very much. Uh, that being said, uh, I, I can give examples of where it is. It's just not that widely used. Certainly on the ground, uh, LIDAR remote sensing is, is very popular. You may have seen the images of 
the uh, Keck Observatory in Hawaii has the green laser beams shooting out of some of the domes. Uh, those are targeting the green oxygen transition. So it, it scatters essentially, it forces oxygen atoms in the upper atmosphere to absorb those photons and then they rescatter, they re-emit when they give up that extra energy, they, they get rid of it again. Uh, and then by measuring the essentially scattered green photons, that tells you something about the oxygen in the upper atmosphere. So yeah, between there's red line, LIDAR, lots of colors, absolutely. And then at that point, you get into the laser technology of how you make a, a laser of a certain color of interest. Uh, and that's something that uh, P. Dragic here in the ECE department knows quite a lot about. Thank you. Sure. We have time for maybe one more question if anyone has a burning one. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, have any problems that are still unsolved where, you know, it's more than just observing images every now and then, but actually doing continuous video analysis of the scene so that you are looking for answers to some questions which require continuous observation and analysis. Absolutely. And in fact, I've, I have clearly been remiss in, in not explaining that well about GLIDE. Uh, GLIDE is a science mission. So we have very well-defined science questions. The goal of the GLIDE mission is to reveal the dynamics of the exosphere, uh, the terrestrial exosphere. Uh, and as part of those global dynamics, what GLIDE will observe for the first time that no one's ever seen is the response of this region to a solar storm. Uh, this is a key driver, the, the density and structure of the hydrogen atoms themselves govern the rate of recovery after these storms. This is something that's well established. What's not known is what is the density? What is the structure? Is, this, is the exosphere round? Is it spherical? Is it elongated? No one knows. So it's very much a mission of discovery. That being said, we have in the course of the mission development identified very specific science questions uh, regarding the nature of that recovery and its drivers uh, that GLIDE will be, uh, in, GLIDE is designed to answer. Thank you very much. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, we are past time. Uh, let's take the time to thanks uh, to thank uh, Professor Waldrop once again. Thank you very much, Lara, for giving. Thank you. My pleasure. Talk. My pleasure. And thanks everyone for coming in. We have the final uh, seminar uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. Please stay tuned. Tell your friends and family to join. With that, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you for the next uh, Saturday for Engineering for Everyone seminar. Bye, everyone. That's great. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much. Glad you could join.